Good morning. I'm sorry. Good evening, Fountain of Life. We are so glad that you're joining us on this Wednesday evening. We have a great Bible study prepared for you about how to maintain your joy. Boy, what what a pertinent topic for the season that we are in right now. Listen, I'm glad that for those of you who are joining us uh, every single week on Wednesday evenings, in fact, I want to encourage you to go ahead and share this out on social media. Even if it's not live, you can still share it out, start a watch party, and just spread the good news, right? So anyway, listen, uh, we're going to be in the book of Philippians tonight. I want to encourage you to grab a pen, a piece of paper, uh, you know, especially your Bible. You know, I've got this Bible right here tonight. It's kind of right but it doesn't matter, right? You need to have a Bible with you. We're going to look in the book of Philippians. But before we do that, we need to really go to the Lord in prayer for Carlos uh, Figueroa and his family, Jeannie. Uh, you know, uh, in particular, what they have suffered is uh, some tragic losses due to COVID-19. Uh, this week, they attended the funeral of Carlos' grandmother who passed away from covid uh, that very day, Carlos' uncle also passed away from COVID. Uh, at the current time of this, uh, you know, this uh, recording, uh, you know, which is on Tuesday, uh, listen, the, the Carlos' uncle, uh, I'm sorry, Carlos' father is, is in the hospital with COVID. We're believing he's going to be released. Amen. We're praying for that. He's intubated, but we're trusting that God is going to, to work all of these things out. So let's just go to the Lord and pray. This has been a difficult season for Carlos and Jeannie and their family. So let's just pray for them. Lord, I just lift Carlos and Jeannie up to you. Lord, they're our friends. They're our family. They're our brothers and sisters in Christ today. And Lord, I pray that your anointing and power and touch would just uh, be with them, that your love would surround them, God, during this season of their life. And Lord, we know there's others, Lord, that are, are suffering, God, as well during this season. But Lord, especially having suffered such grief and such loss, God, I pray that you would uh, surround them with your love and comfort them. And I pray especially today for Carlos' dad. Let the healing virtue of Jesus flow into him right now. Let him get off of this ventilator. Let him overcome this COVID in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Listen, I want to talk to you tonight about how to maintain your joy. Listen, if you're a believer in Jesus, you need to be a happy believer. There's nothing that's a worse testimony than a moany, groany, unhappy, unjoyful believer griping all the time. Listen, God wants us to have joy, and I want to live my life in a joyful kind of way, and I know that you do too. So let's talk about how Christians lose their joy tonight. And uh, anyway, uh, let me ask you something. How long has it been since you've been around a new Christian? New Christians are wonderful, man, when they, you know, it's so beautiful uh, to see the joy that they have. As the scripture talks about the joy of their salvation, you know, just knowing, wow, this burden of sin that I've been living underneath has now been removed. I'm accepted. I'm loved. I'm on my way to heaven. But how is it that after just a few years, some of those very people who were joyous now They've seemed to have lost their joy. They started off great. They were filled with enthusiasm. They were filled with a lot of love. Uh, but, but when they became a Christian, everything was fantastic. But as time goes on, it just seems like they sprang a leak and their joy just kind of drained out of them. And, and I meet a lot of Christians like that. that they're just kind of... How should I say it? Mumbling through life. You know, there's no real joy. And there's, there's a lot of things that would destroy the joy we have in our life. And that's why the book of Philippians, by the way, is an extremely important book. Did you know that Paul talks about joy or rejoicing 17 different times in this short little book of just four chapters? He keeps returning to this point repeating himself. Now, when somebody repeats themselves, we need to know either they're getting really old, right? Or it's something that's really important to them. Uh, and obviously, since the Holy Spirit felt it important to put it into this letter, the fact that we should be 
joyful and rejoicing is important to us. And so repetition is important. So uh, Philippians chapter 3 and verse number 1, Paul goes back to that theme of rejoicing. He says this, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. Listen, Jesus has to be able to make you happy. Your relationship with God has to bring you joy. Rejoice in him. No matter what's going on in the world, there's joy from knowing Jesus. And then he goes on to say, for me to write the same things to you is not tedious, but for you, it's safe. Another version says, this isn't tedious, but it's a safeguard for you. And so I want to give you some safeguards tonight that will help you not to lose your joy. These are things that you can implement in your life that will help you to be able to live a more joyous Christian life. And so Paul, of course, is concerned that the <clears throat> about the joy of the Philippians. He doesn't want them to lose their joy. And so in this passage, he gives us three attitudes we need to have, uh, three, I'm sorry, three safeguards on how to maintain our joy. The first thing is you've got to resist legalistic attitudes. Man, there's nothing that destroys joy like a legalist, like legalism. It destroys the joy in families and people and churches. And as I kind of look back on my life and think about it, I think, you know, actually, I think I've kind of been fighting legalism for many, many years. You know, even way back in Worthington, I didn't even realize it. But even then, as even a young man, I was fighting legalism. But legalism is really substituting the rules and the regulations even biblical rules and regulations for our relationship with Christ. And it can come into the life of a believer in a very, very subtle way. And what it does, it gets your focus off of, 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 of what God has done for you and puts the focus on what we have to do for God, right? And so when you flip the focus all around like that, you're going to lose your joy. And of course, this has been a problem not just in the last couple of decades, but for thousands of years in the church. And in, in the New Testament, there were legalizers, and uh, they were called Judaizers, all right? And these were a group of people that said, yes, believe on Jesus Christ and trust him with all your heart, but guess what? There are some other things you're going to have to add to your faith. And so it became Christ plus your works. And they said that everyone who's a believer in Christ, they also have to follow all of the all of the Jewish laws, right? Uh, they have to follow the Sabbath laws, the circumcision laws, the dietary laws. And of course, when Paul heard about the Judaizers and what they were teaching, their doctrine, he got upset. In fact, he got furious. You're going to see that in this passage in just a minute. Uh, so, and he said they were completely wrong. Uh, interestingly enough, a few years ago, Jorina and I were in, in Israel, and uh, it was the Sabbath, okay? And they had the elevators all set for the Sabbath, because if you don't, you don't want to break the rule of pushing the button on the Sabbath, that might be considered working on the Sabbath if you push the button. So if we were on the fifth floor, the elevators would open up on the fifth floor, let you in, open up on the fourth floor, let you in and out. It didn't matter if you push the buttons or not. It just went up and down and opened and shut at every floor. Yeah, what a crazy way to live. And so living under such extreme rules can make a person very, very miserable. Uh, I remember back in, uh, the, 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 actually in this church about 20 years ago, there was a style that young men used to wear. They used to wear a nice t-shirt underneath a, a shirt and then they would not button their shirt. They'd just kind of put their shirt on, even a short sleeve shirt like a jacket. And one guy in the church, man, he just thought that was so wrong. You've got to button up your shirt. That's wrong to come to church with your shirt unbuttoned. I'm like, man, dude, leave them alone, man. They're nice kids. They're serving. Look, they're completely modest. They look sharp. They're all dressed up for church even. They're wearing a nice shirt, not just a t-shirt. But anyway, that's what rules do. They make you miserable. They'll take away your joy. And so here in Philippians chapter 3, Paul is really getting on the Judaizers who are trying to steal the joy of the Christians in Philippi. This is what he has to say. Philippians chapter 3, verse 2. He says, Beware 
of dogs. Calls them dogs. Beware of dogs. Beware of evil do, do workers. Uh, beware of the mutilation. For we are the circumcision who worship God in the spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. Now, when you and I, when we think of dogs, we think of warm, cuddly pets, right? But in the New Testament, dogs were not pets. They were wild scavengers who would attack human beings. It was the worst thing you could do to call somebody a dog. And I realize, you know, today's culture, people say, hey, dog, you know, no, no, Paul, was, Paul wasn't doing that here, okay? He was letting these Judaizers have it. These people were telling the Gentile believers in order to be saved, they had to also be circumcised. If you don't, uh, so, and uh, he actually calls them mutilators. They were putting all of their confidence, these Judaizers, in the flesh, in what they had done to their flesh, according to the Old Testament law. But Paul comes along and says, look, man, we are the real circumcision because circumcision is just a picture of taking, a, 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 you know, a part of the flesh and throwing it away. We've done that. We've cut away the evil things out of our life. And we're the ones who worship God in the spirit. And we're the ones who are rejoicing in Jesus Christ. And so the, the greatest way you can, 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 can maintain your joy is to live by this safeguard. Live each day by grace grace if you're going to have a happy home don't be legalistic okay okay you should have washed that cup and put it in the dishwasher you know but okay you didn't okay let things go a little bit live by grace uh you know and that's the way god deals with us he deals with us by grace and, and to realize that everything god does in you and through you is by grace rather than working for it and earning it is important and grace really is the secret to living with joy of course paul what he does he uses his life as an example he was a superstar legalist before he became a believer he had tried all the rules the regulations and for paul it didn't work for him so look at what he says here in philippians 3 verses 4 through 6 is what he says. Hope you got your Bible with you. He says, though I also might have confidence in the flesh. If anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so. And he says, circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, concerning the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness that is in the law, he says, I was blameless. So he's saying, look, man, I, I know more about being a legalist than any legalist there was because I was a super legalist. And uh, what he does here in this passage, he really gives us five examples of legalism that we can apply into our life today. And so how do you know if you're falling into this trap of legalism? Here's how. If you begin to trust in rituals, Paul says, I was circumcised on the eighth day of the stock of Israel. And, uh, of course, in the Old Testament, circumcision was part of the Old Testament covenant. It's not a part of the New Testament covenant. Uh, we have our own rituals today. There's baptism rituals. I say ordinances, but there's baptism. There's communion. There's, uh, you know, some churches have catechism, baby dedications, these types of things. And all those things are fine. They're okay. They're good. But let me tell you something. We can't trust in those things uh, because they can't really save you. If you fall into trusting in those things for your salvation, you're in trouble, okay? remember one time I talked to a lady here at the church, uh, you know, she was kind of a sporadic attender here, and uh, she had been underneath the teaching from somebody else that said, you, in order to be healthy and whole, you actually have to spend time and you need to take communion every single day in your personal life and in your personal devotions, and otherwise you allow a curse to be opened up, and you know, she had this whole big teaching, and she wanted me to teach that at Fountain of Life, and I was just like, no, I'm not going to do that because, you know, I mean, I believe in communion. Communion is wonderful, right? 
But I can't trust in communion to give me help. I trust in God to give me help. How many of you see the difference? There's legalism involved. And if you have to, if you have to do it every day, what if you miss a day? Oh my goodness! Now I'm going to get sick. No, 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 no. We don't, we don't teach legalistic things like that. And then the next thing is you, you don't trust in race. Paul says, "I was of the people of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin." Now. You know, many think that Benjamin was really the purest tribe in Israel. And uh, Paul, before he changed his name, was Saul, right? Saul was named, and so, so he, he was named actually after a Benjamite uh, who was a king, right? And, said, and so Paul says, you know, I used to trust in my heritage. And uh, there's a lot of people out there who would kind of, they still have this kind of legalistic thing where they're trusting in their heritage, in their race, in their family, in order for Christ, you know, in order for, the, in order for Christianity to be a part of their lives. Have you ever heard anybody say something like this? You know, my daddy's a Christian. My mama was a wonderful Christian. She was a great prayer warrior. You should have seen what my grandfather did. He started a church over here, and my uncle's a pastor. Now, let me tell you something. All of that doesn't really matter, right? Uh, you can get religion by osmosis, but you can't get Christ by osmosis. You need to have a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. So, so don't trust in your heritage. Trust in Christ. Uh, and then uh, don't trust in religion. Religion can't save a person. Uh, and Paul was a very religious person. He says, I was a Hebrew of Hebrews, all right? And Jesus, of course, I don't think he has anything to do with religion except that he's 100% opposed to it. Now, I've been a part of the Assemblies of God for, boy, going to be 61 years on Saturday. I was born into it. And I used to tell people, yeah, I'm sure I got an AG tattoo on me, on me somewhere, you know, because I've just been in it so long. But, you know, but, but, but religion is really kind of man's attempt to get to God, right? And uh, it's, it's all about works. It's, 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 but, 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 but Jesus Christ is God's attempt to get to man. And uh, there's not any single denomination that has a copyright on truth or a patent on God. And I don't think when we get to heaven, God's just going to say, oh, yeah, that you had it everything right. I don't think so. There's a lot to get right in order to, to for that to happen. But, but what I've understood and what I'm trying to say is that the assemblies of God, which I'm a part of, I love, I'm a part of that organization, that can't save me. Joining a member, being a membership of the assembly of God, saying I'm the religion of the assemblies of God, that can't save you. It can't save me, okay? And uh, what's interesting to me as well is that a couple of years ago, we had a man that came into our our body. He was a great guy, actually a pretty nice teacher, but, but uh, you know, he, he continually wanted to talk about Assembly of God doctrine. Now, let me tell you something. I teach Assembly of God doctrine. You can, I can prove that to you. Everything I say is Assembly of God doctrine, all right? But I just don't tell people, this is Assembly of God doctrine. You know, I tell them, this is the Bible. This is Bible doctrine. We teach and preach the Bible here. And uh, what was funny was when he started referring back to Assembly of God doctrine, our people said, well, you know, we don't care about Assembly of God doctrine. What's the Bible say? You know, so, so I think, you know, that's what I'm trying to say. People have all kinds of religious stuff that they have, you know. Some people may have to have a picture of Jesus on their wall, or they may hang a cross from their car, you know, or, you know, all these different things. And there's even, there's even this idea of this, I call it a religion of, of revivalism. And don't get me wrong, I love revival. I want revival. And I understand that we've got to pray, we've got to sacrifice, we've got to believe. But let me tell you something, if you read too much revivalist literature, it's literally like, you know, your religion, your, your own, uh, your passion and dedication that's what saves you and that's what brings revival no my friend revival comes from god when we humble ourselves but anyway uh, here's the thing religion isn't the thing relationship with christ is the thing and so having just religion that just that just takes away your joy we're talking about maintaining your joy and then don't trust in rules no this is a big one paul says in regard to the law i was a pharisee Paul kept all the rules. 
And when we think of the Pharisees as hypocrites, you know, uh, you know that it's true to a certain degree. But man, they were there were some very genuine, sincere ones. They were the spiritually elite of their age. They took the Ten Commandments and they expanded them into six hundred and nineteen other commandments, and they were legalists. A Pharisee would not even eat an egg. If it were late on the Sabbath, because, boy, that might be considered work. If he got bit by a mosquito on the Sabbath, he wouldn't scratch it because that was considered work. A Pharisee would not even allow a woman to look in a mirror on the Sabbath day because she might see a gray hair and be tempted to pull that out. And that would be considered work. And so, uh, you know, we've, we've, we've heard all this stuff, right? All the rules and regulation you know, you don't dress in a certain way. You know, you got to wear your hair in a certain way, on and on. There are whole groups of people in other parts of the world that, you know, that if you don't wear white, you're not truly a believer. Other ones, guys, I've heard it preached, if you don't wear long sleeves, you're not a believer. On and on. That's even for men, by the way. But uh, but let me tell you, what, what I've found out is that following rules and regulations won't make you holy and uh, you may make make you might make you appear holy but it won't keep you holy on the inside and uh, what keeps you holy on the inside is having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ now when i was a teen my wife and i well she wasn't my wife then but Dreen and i snuck into the movies okay that was against the rules of the assembly of god church we attended you could watch a movie on TV, but just not go to a theater and watch one, all right? And uh, interestingly enough, inside the movies, we found, guess what? Oh, somebody else who attended the church was there too. And man, they went home and told their parent, their her, her parent. And, and anyway, it actually came up in a board meeting when my dad was the pastor. Jareen's dad was a deacon. Man, Jareen got in trouble that, over that. And but my dad told me something that was really good, actually. I'm going to give my dad some kudos here. He told me, he said, look, son, I heard you went to the movies. And I said, yeah, I did. And he said, well, just understand, I can't be around to tell you where to go and what to do. You're responsible to God for what you do now. I thought that was pretty good advice. But uh, anyway, legalism just destroys people's happiness. It destroys the joy. I hate legalism. Back in Stanford, Texas, we had a young man by the name of Ricky got saved. Man, he was, he was uh, no, Danny, that was his name, Danny. Danny got saved, and, and uh, the next Sunday, man, he came to church. He had whipped down and got an earring of a great big cross. It was about this long, man. It just was this big cross, and he would bought a, a, a black suit and tie. He's a young guy, maybe 17 years old, and he had his hair cut. And Man, he looked awesome with that, and that cross symbolized to me that he loved Jesus. And he wore that cross for a few weeks to church, and then all of a sudden, one day, he didn't have it on, and I... I asked him, I said, hey, Ricky, man, I mean, I said, hey, Danny, what, what happened to the cross? And he said, well, I got convicted. Oh, I said, really, you got convicted? What does convicted mean? He had no idea. What had happened was some lady in the church had told him, you shouldn't be wearing a cross like that. On and on. I hate legalism. It just takes the joy. It took, it took Danny's joy away. That cross was an outward symbol of his faith in Jesus Christ. That was wrong to do. I'm sorry. Anyway, and then you can't trust. We're talking about maintaining. I can tell story after story about legalism. Uh, but anyway, and you can't trust in your reputation either, you know. Uh, as for, Paul says, as for zeal and legalistic righteousness, I was faultless. A lot of people have the reputation of all the things that they do because they're a Christian. I read the Bible. I go to church. I tithe. I don't eat pork. On and on it goes. In fact, I had an uncle. I'm sorry if you're listening, uncle, but I had a, a relative. I'll tell you which uncle it was, but he had a relative, and he was, he was at my mom's house, and he was just getting on my mother because she was cooking some food. It had little pieces of bacon in it, and I'm just like... I, he's like Christians don't eat bacon and I just had to take him to the word of God and show him different okay 
And uh, anyway, so don't trust in your rep, 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 re, reputation. Paul says this, in, I mean, the writer of Romans says, in Romans 14 to 17, may want to jot that down. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. It's not what you do, in other words. It's not how you eat and drink. It's not all of that. It's do you have peace? Do you have his righteousness in your heart? Or do you have the joy of the Holy Ghost? And so if, if, if the Christian life were a bunch of don'ts, anybody who was dead would qualify because they don't do anything. All right. Uh, anyway, so uh, the next thing we've got to do in order to maintain our joy, and write this down, is sometimes we need to reevaluate our activities. A lot of people are looking for joy in all the wrong places of life. Now, I believe it's okay to have a full and active life. You should... You know, enjoy times with your family. You should have a job. Take care of the yard. Enjoy shopping. You know, but if you don't maintain, those are activities, right? But if you don't maintain the source of your joy, all the other activities that you do, can you'll lose your joy even in those things. And so when I re say reevaluate your activities, what I'm saying is, is your number one activity, your personal relationship with Jesus. Is he everything? And what Paul is doing here is he's comparing the value of religion to the value of having a relationship with Jesus Christ. And there's really no comparison, right? He had been a very, very religious person, Paul had, but but he was lost. And even religious activity without Jesus Christ, it doesn't actually bring joy. It actually becomes a very heavy thing. And uh, so Paul says this in verse 7, that he says, whatever things were gained to me, these I have counted loss. That's the first time he says loss. I've counted them loss for Christ. In other words, he's saying all the activities that I was doing, they didn't bring me any joy. So I count them as loss. And then he goes on to say, yet indeed, I also count all things loss. Except, there's a second time, all things loss for the excellency of the knowledge of of Christ Jesus my Lord, whom I have suffered the loss of all things, three different losses there, and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ. Paul was saying, I have found the source of joy. It's not a religious activity. It's in Jesus. It's in Christ. Uh, I count all the other stuff, he says, just as, as rubbish, because when I know Christ, that's when I experience joy. And how many of you realize that in an organization, we have profit and loss? I'm sitting here at my desk. Actually, right here is a profit and loss statement, okay, from Fountain of Life right there, okay? And uh, Paul Paul uh, talks about profit just one time in this verse, and he talks about loss, profit or gain one time in this verse, and he talks about loss three different times. And, and, and uh, Philip's translation says this. He says, I count it all mere garbage compared to being able to win, uh, to win Christ. And actually, the translators are being very polite, very delicate. Garbage and rubbish uh, is not actually the term. It's actually the term for dung or manure. He says, I count it all Okay, we'll let you fill in the blank there. Dung, okay, for the, you know, for, you know. And so he says, all the other activities, you know, they're only so much junk if you compare them to the real source of joy. And so what you've got to do is you've got to keep your priorities in perspective. If you have want to have joy, you got to really know what's important. You have to know what's profitable for you and what's loss for you. And don't lose your joy over stuff that doesn't really count, right? And the number one reason why people lose their joy is that they have misplaced the priorities in their life. They get involved in things that aren't really that important. And if so if like having prestige is the most important thing in your life, you're going to lose your joy if somebody slights you, okay? If having possessions and getting ahead in life and having money and things, if that's the most important thing in your life, if that if you think that's going to be your source of joy, the moment you meet somebody else who has better stuff than you or more money or a better job or a, a better looking wife or a sharper husband or whatever, you're going to feel jealousy. You're going to, you're going to, it's going to make you lose your joy. And so 
Remember that your life doesn't consist of the stuff that you possess. It doesn't consist of, you know, the house that you live in. Your real life consists in having a relationship with Jesus Christ. And uh, Paul does tell us, and he points this out in verse number eight, that life kind of consists of trade-offs, right? It's an important lesson that you got to learn in life. Paul said, I had to give up some things count them as loss in order to gain something else. He gave up religion and religious activities in order to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And, and, and the number one reason why people don't have joy is that they have the wrong priorities in life. And uh, a lot of people are afraid that they're going to have to give up something in order to become a Christian. And guess what? They're right. <laughs> when you come to Jesus, you give up everything you've got. Otherwise, you're not really a real Christian. It's a total commitment. But the good news is that you've never had it so good, right? All the other things that you were hoping in, trusting in to bring you life, I mean, you know, they're still there, you know, a lot of them in our life. I mean, unless it was sinful things. But, but, uh, once you come to Christ, you realize what the real joy comes from. You know, you give up all the guilt. You know, who wants to carry around guilt? You give up guilt in order to gain a clear conscience. You give up worry in order to gain a power for real living. You give up frustration and lack of purpose in life in order to gain a real purpose in life and real meaning in life. You actually give up going to hell and gain going to heaven. Boy, that's a good one, right? You give up trying to solve all your problems in your own power, and you gain having the resources to help of God, all the resources of God to help you solve your problems. Man, that's a pretty good trade-off right there. And so Jim Elliott of the, you know, said this many years ago. He said, he is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep for that which he cannot lose. You're not a fool if you give up what you can't keep for that which you cannot lose. And so what are you afraid of giving up for God? Uh, you know, if, you're, if you become a Christian, a really committed to Christ, you know, what are you afraid that, you know, that something's going to change in your life? I'm telling you, those are the lies of the devil. That's the thing that's actually stealing your joy because Jesus is the source of joy. <laughs> Jesus is the one that we get our joy from. Let me tell you, the closer I get to Jesus, the happier I am. And, and let me tell you why. It's because that joy just begins to bubble over into everything that you do. You're just happy when you're at the store. You're just joyful when you're with your family. You're just, you're, and because you're joyful and happy and content and at peace, other people respond to that with joyfulness and happiness and contentment and peace. And guess what? Even the Bible says, even your enemies will be at, made at peace with you. God wants us to live a life full of joy. And what I'm saying is, if you think that all of your activities are going to bring you joy in life, well, I'm going to the gym, I'm doing this, do, do, let me tell you something, all of that can become burdensome if you don't have Jesus. Make your number one activity Jesus, okay? And then also we've got our, some, in order to maintain our joy, the third thing we've got to do is refocus our ambitions. And Paul, of course, you know, made his ambition known. He's late. It's late in his life. You know, he's getting older, just like me. He's getting older. And this is what he says. Philippians 3.10. He says that I, this is still his ambition, that I may know him, know Christ, and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. In other words, Paul says, my number one goal in life is to know Christ better and better. So the question becomes, how well do you know Jesus Christ? Uh, you know, I know a lot of Christians who've been Christians five, ten, many, many years sometimes, and they really don't know Jesus Christ very well. Uh, they might know a lot about him, but they don't know him. And uh, when Paul talks about knowing him, he's talking about knowing him on, in a close way. 
You know, I don't like the word intimate because, you know, it has a lot of connotations in our society. But to be intimate is to be close, to be to, to shared, you know, to understand that person's thoughts, to understand where that person's coming from, to know. And if we're going to know Christ, we've got to know what he thinks, how he feels, what he says, what he, what he wants us to do. He, we communicate with him. He communicates with us. I, I love the way the Amplified Version puts this verse. This is Paul's ambition, and I hope it becomes your ambition too, all right? Because this is an ambition that will bring you joy in life. This is a safeguard in your life that will main, help you maintain your joy. That's what he says. For my determined purpose is that I may know Christ. I may progressively become more and deeply and intimately acquainted with him, perceiving and recognizing and understanding him more strongly and more clearly. Wow. I love that. I love that amplified version of Philippians 3.10. And, and that kind of knowledge, let me tell you what it is. It is very personal. It's progressive. It's continual. It's ongoing. And so... The question is, how are you knowing Christ better right now? And interestingly enough, we've had a season, right, where God has uh, allowed things to be shut down. The coronavirus has shut things down. We're shut down. We can't do anything, okay? And, and so the question is, have we used that time to get to know God better, or are we just twiddling our life away, you know, watching, you know, reruns on TV. All right. So, so get to know God. And there's a big difference between, like I said a moment ago, between knowing him and knowing about him. And uh, so here's the safeguard. Uh, you got, you need to get to know Christ better and better. Never stop growing and developing your relationship with Christ. The moment you stop growing, you're going to lose your joy. And uh, so many Christians just kind of stay right where they're at, kind of at the position where they got into Christianity, got into the Christian life. They haven't grown any since they, you know, they made that initial decision. And so, so here's the question. How, how do you get to know God in a, in a personal way? First of all, it's like any other relationship. It's going to take time. It takes time to know anybody, to develop a relationship. It takes time to get to know God. You need to spend time alone with God and get to know him. Sit down with your Bible, read it, pray uh, to God, talk with God about your wants and needs, listen to worship music, learn how to listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit, spend time with God, allow him to speak to you through his word. You know, you cannot develop a relationship with somebody when you're in a crowd, you know, and the only time many Christians ever think about Christ is when they come to church in a crowd, when they're with other Christians. And I'm not saying don't come to church. No, that's an important part of being a believer, right? But you've got to take time to be with him. And then it takes talk. It takes talk. You got to talk to God. You got to pray. And, uh, you know, you don't have to have a lot of flowery words or big expressions. You don't have to know a lot about the Bible. Just talk to God about what's on your in your mind, what's going on in your daily life. Ask him, what do you think about these things? Talk to him and start asking God for things. Start believing him for things, right? John 16, 24 says, until now you have not asked for anything in my name. A lot of believers, their 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 joy in their life is 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 uh, is they don't have any joy because they're not asking for anything. They're not believing for anything. They're just walking through life, kind of like nonchalantly. Listen, the scripture says this: ask, and your joy will be complete. I'm teaching you how to maintain your joy here. You know, as you get to know Christ better and better, and you ask for more, you know, more joy will come. No prayer, no joy. All right. And, uh, and then the third thing, not only time, not only talk, but we also got to have trust. Relationships are built on trust. You know, if you don't trust your husband or your wife or your mom or your dad, you're not going to have a good relationship with them. And uh, God wants you to learn how to trust him. And he's going to allow all kinds of problems in your life so that you can learn that he is reliable all the time. God's reliable in every situation. He can be counted on to be faithful. You know, and I, I didn't learn this overnight, but man, I've walked with God a long time, you know. I've been pastoring for, you know, 37 years or something. Well, 1982, it'll be 
1982, I graduated 2022, it'll be 40 years, okay, so 38 years, okay, I've been pastoring and in ministry, and uh, I've learned to trust in God. He's going to pull through, pro to pull us through the problems of life. He's going to pull us through things, you know, uh, and Paul here at the end of his life, you know, he's saying, listen, the number one ambition of my life is just to get to know him better. I want to trust him more. I want to, even in the in, in the sufferings that I go through, I, you know, I want I want to have his fellowship with me during those times. And if there's any power, it's in me. It's because of the resurrection of Jesus. To know him in the fellowship of his of his suffering and the and, and the power of his resurrection. And uh, so the question is this, man. As we end this Bible study tonight, are you losing your joy? Are you maintaining your joy? Uh, and w which one of these things are the culprit? You know, what, what, what's causing you to lose it? Uh, I'm trying to make these uh, by Wednesday evening sessions really, really practical. So is it legalism? Are there certain rules, you know, that you've kind of substituted for your relationship to Christ? If I do this, and if I do that, and if I avoid these things, and if other things, people will, you know, think well of me, and God will think well of me. You know, so we say, if, 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 man, that makes you an iffy Christian. You know, we don't want to be an iffy Christian. We want to be a real Christian, right? If I do this, God will accept me. If I do this, God will love me. No, my friend, he loves you and accepts you. He's made up his mind about you. Just rejoice in him, loving him. It's not the rules and regulations. It's Christ, all right? Uh, you know, maybe some of you have never really put your trust in Christ and you're watching this. You might be a religious person, a moral person, a good person. You go to church, but you've never really trusted in Jesus Christ for your salvation and uh if you think that, you know, that, you know, if you keep your bad works at a minimum and your good works are going to outnumber them, then you're going to make it. Listen, God doesn't grade on a curve, man. He judges by a perfect standard, and that perfect standard is Jesus Christ. To be get good, get good enough to get to God, you'd have to be good as Jesus. And there's no one that has done that is 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 that good. And that's why we need to trust in him. Or maybe you've been like Paul, just trusting in all the rituals. You were baptized as a kid, and you know, but you've never, you know, you, you've never really had a close relationship with Christ. Uh, you know, maybe you just have had some kind of a religion. You know, uh, I know a, a lot of people in the traditional religion of, of Roman Catholicism. They often refer to their religion. You know, and I believe there's people that in the, are in the Catholic Church that they know Jesus, and that's a wonderful thing. But let me tell you something. Religious religion can't save you. Only Christ can save you. And so so the, these are the most important things. And, uh, you know, materialism, man, that can take away your joy, too. <laughs> the more stuff you get, the more you got to oil it, take care of it. You know, man. So what's in your profit and loss statement? You know, do you is is the most important thing your relationship with Christ? A lot of people are kind of like that old game we used to play called Trivial Pursuit. They're they're living their lives pursuing the trivial things of life. Okay, you got a new iPhone 11. Woohoo! Uh, does that make you better? No, it doesn't. Does, does it make you happy? It'll entertain you for a while, but guess what? They're going to come out with the iPhone 13 and 14. Then what are you going to do? All right, I'm just playing here. Listen, uh, what I'm saying is all that stuff, materialism is a killjoy. Don't let it destroy your joy. Have Let Jesus be your joy. Let me just pray with you today. Heavenly Father, I pray for those who've been watching this Bible study tonight. And God, I just pray that you would put your arms around them. Let them know how much you love them, God. Let them know how much you care. Let them know that, that you want them to maintain a life of joy. And just as Paul began this whole passage, we're going to rejoice in Christ Jesus right now. We're going to rejoice in the 
fact that he went to the cross and died for us. We're going to rejoice in the fact that his blood has covered over every mistake, every sin that we've ever made. We're going to rejoice in the fact that he's given us an inheritance that's incorruptible and undefiled, that we're going to be with Christ in heaven forever. We're going to rejoice in the fact that he's provided for us everything that we need for this life and, 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 and for life and for godliness. And so, Lord, I just pray, God, that your joy would just fill us now, joy unspeakable and full of, of glory. You know, uh, that's a joy that we want to have. And so I pray that for everyone listening tonight, that you would just fill their lives with joy. Let them maintain joy. Don't let legalism or false priorities or any of these things destroy the joy, but let them enjoy their relationship with Christ. Hey, listen, thank you for joining with us tonight. Listen, um, I want to invite you to be back with us Sunday morning at uh, 1030 on Facebook Live or join us in person at Fountain of Life Christian Center. Listen, if you're enjoying these Bible studies and a part of this ministry, you can. we appreciate your financial support. You can uh, give online at folcc.org. That's the first letters of Fountain of Life Christian Center, folcc.org. And uh, you look under give and you can give there. We're appreciative of all the financial support and we're appreciative of you watching and sharing this out on social media. May the Lord bless you and keep you, cause his face to shine upon you, be gracious unto you, and may you know the joy of the Lord. May you rejoice in him. He's good. God bless you. Thank you for joining us.